So presenters, um, you can start talking uh, whenever you would like to welcome everyone to the webinar. And just a reminder to presenters, if you are not speaking, please mute yourself so we don't hear any feedback. Uh, and thank you again, everyone, for attending our webinar. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. This discussion is coordinated by the Center for Community Solutions, a nonpartisan think tank focused on solutions to health, social and economic issues, and the Council on Older Persons, otherwise known as COOP. COOP is an advisory committee to the Center for Community Solutions for issues related to the needs and interests of older adults. I'd like to provide a brief introduction of our speakers before turning it over to the first one. Jill Frankel, has served in the role of Director of Solon's Department of Senior and Adult Services since her appointment in 2008. Mary McNamara was appointed by Mayor Frank Jackson to serve as Director of the Cleveland Department on Aging in 2016 and oversee the Age-Friendly Cleveland Initiative. And Emily Matillo is a research fellow at the, Senator, at the Center for Community Solutions. She has written two recent pieces on social isolation, titled Preventing Social Isolation When the Senior Center Closes and Social Isolation, A Quiet Social Determinant of Health. Emily, I'd like to turn it over to you first. Thank you, Stacy, and thank you for inviting me to um, be a part of the webinar today. Um, I'm excited to be here from my very own home office and I have sent my children, my dogs and my husband away. And so I should have at least 20 minutes of quiet. Um, I won't even take that long though. Um, so I'd like to go ahead and start. Um, oh, there's me. Um, I'd like to start by giving you a framework of social isolation as a social, de social determinant of health. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware of social determinants of health, but just as a quick reminder, social determinants of health are conditions in the environment in which people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health, uh, functioning, and quality of life outcomes and risks. Um, these are the many, many things outside of the medical system that have large influences on a person's physical and mental health. Um, the table I have up here is from the Kaiser Family Foundation, and it lays out the commonly accepted social determinants and the subcategories under them. If we look specifically at community and social context, this is where so social isolation fits into the social determinants model. The subcategories of social integration, support systems, and community engagement really speak to opportunities a person has to be socially engaged and socially connected. Um, social integration refers to how well groups are incorporated into the general society. So we can think of how well older adults are incorporated into a community. Um, we consider how much or how little they feel like they belong to that community. Um, and community, of course, can be mean many different things to different people. So a community could be the geographic neighborhood you live in. It could be your faith community. It could be related to a community related to a profession or a hobby. Um, it's just that concept of a group of people and how well integrated they are. Uh, support systems are the people and networks that surround an individual to help when help is needed. Uh, many of us are probably feeling some disruption of our own support systems during the pandemic and maybe really recognizing how important they are to our well-being. Community, community engagement is a process that allows community members to have agency in the decision-making processes within that community. So it's the, um, the function that allows for in, uh, input on process, decision-making, and strategy implementation of community decisions. And all of these things can play a role in whether or not a person feels socially isolated or socially connected within their community. In addition to community and social context, I also believe that neighborhood and physical environment really play a large role in so social isolation. 
um, the type of housing a person lives in, whether they have access to transportation to go and visit with people, um, the safety of a neighborhood, and really whether people feel comfortable outside in their parks and playgrounds. And when we think of older adults, I think this is especially true for those who have decided to stop driving or don't feel comfortable using public transportation or don't have access to public transportation. Um, how much does their world shrink and how comfortable do they feel immediately outside of the place where they live? Um, do people have places to walk and interact with other people? Um, when I think about this, I really think about one of my neighbors who is, um, I think he's in his 80s. And on nice days, you can always count on him sitting outside um, on his driveway and calling out to the people who walk past. And I, he lives alone. And I think that is his um, social connectedness with people. If he didn't feel comfortable outside, I think he would be um, incredibly socially isolated. Um, zip code, I think, is also an important uh, way to look at social isolation. And I've actually requested some um, social isolation by zip code, some data on that for Ohio um, from a researcher with the Americans Health Ranking Senior Report. And so um, I should get that in the next couple of weeks and hope to write a blog post about that, highlighting some of the areas in Ohio that may have um, more older adults who are experiencing social isolation. So with the frame, that frame that social isolation is a social determinant of health and being socially isolated can impact health outcomes. Um, I just wanna quickly share two pieces of research on social isolation. Um, this here is a, first piece here is a study done by the AARP um, Public Policy Institute. And this study looked at Medicare spending and found that Medicare beneficiaries who are identified as socially isolated had higher medical costs than those that were not socially isolated. So this chart is from an infographic that was prepared by AARP, and it shows the cost of care for socially isolated individuals is higher than those with arthritis and nearly as high as those with high blood pressure. There's, this is pretty good evidence that socially isolated individuals require more health care interventions than their non-socially isolated peers. And we can probably assume that it's quite likely that they need more intervention because they are less healthy. Um, another piece of research that I thought was really interesting about social isolation is was a literature review of um, risk factors for mortality associated with so social isolation. Um, and the researchers really compared it to the social, um, social isolation to the obesity ep epidemic. So about 30 or so years ago, researchers started noticing behavioral changes among the general American population that resulted in increased caloric intake and decreased physical activity. Um, and, and many of us are pretty aware of the, the worsening health outcomes related to obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular, and those things have led to higher mortality rates. Um, through research and their own practices, medical professionals became aware of the rise in obesity and eventually public health campaigns were launched. Uh, the health campaigns led to a community-wide focus on behaviors to reduce and change those behaviors that led to the condition. For me, the example that comes to mind is um, around obesity is First Lady Michelle Obama's focus on healthy eating and physical activity, particularly for children. I have very vivid images of her talking about um, gardening with children and also like I can readily think of her dancing with Ellen and encouraging people to get up and move. Um, researchers in this study believe we are at a point where changes in behavior and society have been observed um, around social isolation and social connectedness. And we have seen how social, social isolation impacts health. And so now we are starting to get to a point of building awareness among professionals. And all of us here on this webinar are, um, can help us get to that next step of public awareness and community behavior change. I also um, think that it's really important whenever we talk about social isolation to think about the differences between social isolation and loneliness because they can occur at the same time, but they can also occur independent of each other. And I really liked this language from the um, Age UK um, that describes the difference. So it describes that loneliness is a subjective feeling about the gap between a person's desired levels of social contact and their actual level of social contact. It, received, it refers to the perceived quality of the person's relationships. Loneliness is never desired and lessening these feelings can take a long time. 
Social isolation is an objective measure of the number of contacts that people have. It is about the quantity and not quality of relationships. People may choose to have a small number of contacts. Um, when people feel socially isolated, this can be overcome relatively quickly by increasing the number of people that they are in contact with. So, you know, two months ago, we may have had some really different ideas about how to make sure people are socially connected. With our world changing so dramatically, um, those ideas have had to change. And we have to really think creatively about how to reduce social isolation when we cannot be physically together. Um, I'm sure Mary and Jill have many things to share about what they're doing locally. Um, but I just have two really quick examples of some um, national best practices. Okay. Um, and so these were uh, highlighted in uh, the blog I recently wrote about when the senior centers close. And the first one is the um, self-help virtual senior center. Um, and it's a gathering, an online gathering place that offers um, live interactive video-based classes. And they have 25 to 35 classes offered each week on a variety of topics. When I look at this image and that computer screen, it is now so familiar to me after a month, a month of doing Zooms for work, for school, for socializing. Um, and this is a platform specifically de designed to be easy to use by older adults and those with low computer literacy. Um, the next example I have is a call-in model. And so this is through an organization called Well Connected. Um, all their classes offered can be joined through a phone call. Um, some classes also have an online component, but for those with online components, you can also request handouts that can be mailed to you so you can still follow along without the actual um, online component. There are currently 44 states that Well Connected is in. I believe it's operated out of California is where it originated, but they can, anyone from anywhere can connect. Um, this here is just a sample of classes they offer. I just screenshotted one of the 50 pages they have of different course offerings. There's a huge range of topics. And then finally, I just wanted to share um, some really preliminary things we're seeing from a survey that we at Community Solutions have um, put out there. And so if you haven't had a chance to take the survey, it's for designed for people who work for health and human service agencies and is helping us understand how people have adjusted to um, life after coronavirus or during coronavirus. Um, the survey is still open, so you can still take it and you should take it. Um, but I thought it would be helpful just to share some really preliminary things that we're finding. Um, one thing is people have been telling us is that some agencies have discontinued in-house services to older adults. They're receiving or reporting an increased demand for home delivered meals. Many sites are offering um, grab and go lunches um, where they had previously done uh, congregate meals. Um, many agencies serving older adults reported that they are having difficulty getting enough PPE for staff who are going into adults, older adults homes. One agency mentioned that they actually had to reduce their meal delivery. Um, they had been doing it daily and now they just do it twice weekly. Um, distribution of donated um, durable medical equipment has reduced. So one of the agencies had been giving out canes and walkers um, and has had to pull back on that. And then many agencies mentioned now that they are delivering case management services and mental health services by phone instead of in person. Um, so I think it's also, you know, I didn't put it on the side, but I think one thing we're seeing through our survey too is the importance and the concern that people are having about staff who are working for um, health and human service agencies. And we know that um, this whole situation has resulted in an incredible amount of stress and it's taking an emotional toll on everyone. And so we do know that everybody's pretty concerned about the, um, the health and well-being of their staff as well. And that is all I have. So I will go ahead and turn it over to Mary. Great. Thank you, Emily. So my name is Mary McNamara, and I'm with the City of Cleveland Department of Aging. And the pictures that are in my PowerPoint are really just to remind all of us what older adults are missing as they isolate at home. 
whether it's the exercise dance group at John F. Kennedy Rec Center, the senior men's volleyball team at Gunning, their Tai Chi class, the musical groups they play with, sitting next to someone at their women's group, community festivals, their silver sneakers class, attending their monthly city council meeting, the joy of just sitting next to someone at the senior center and doing a puzzle together or playing cards with a friend at the center, looking someone eye to eye um, and connecting about a shared experience. Uh, the personal exchange of a smile at a produce distribution at the rec center. I could go on and on. These pictures in my PowerPoint um, inspire us to keep reaching out. They're real seniors at Cleveland events, but nothing I'm going to share comes close to replacing these face-to-face -face connections, the power of a smile or a touch. But during this time, I will do, I will share what we have done and look forward to also learning from all of you. So um, first, an important message I knew I wanted to communicate to Cleveland seniors was that the Department of Aging was still open five days a week and was here to help. And one of the challenges was, how do I get out that information? I think there's so much news out there that so much has closed that people were surprised to hear they were still open. They could call us and we could help them with a specific COVID-19 need like home delivered meals, um, emergency food or accurate information about the stimulus check, or they could just call us with a need related to successful aging. It could be about Medicare, home repairs, transportation. So the most efficient way I thought to do this in a city with 70,000 older adults was via the telephone. So I wanted to share with you a few ways we're using the telephone. I knew it was also the communication device most people have. In 2018, more than 47,000 Cleveland households, it's almost 28%, still lacked home broadband internet subscriptions of any type, including a mobile data plan. Now that figure is not specific to older adults, but I think all of us know there's a significant older adult um, digital divide. That number is specific to all households. So the first thing we did was we utilized the city's code red system. There are many companies out there that do this kind of automatic robocall. In many communities, it comes out of the Division of Public Safety. So we used the city's code red system very early on in this pandemic to make calls to seniors um, from Mayor Jackson, each one with a specific message from the mayor with information, tips, resources, and very often a reassuring message that we would get through this together. So to date, we've made five calls, and that has reached with either a live answer or a voicemail message, uh, 252,653 numbers. Now keep in mind those are five calls, so those are you know, once a week calls, duplicate calls. So the last call, just to give you a sense, was made on April 7th, and it reached 69,476 households with a live um, answer or a voicemail. So these phone numbers are from lists we have pulled, obtained, and purchased over the years. This is really an incredibly efficient way to reach a lot of people with a known and trusted voice. And it may feel impersonal as I talk about 69,000 calls, but to the recipient, um, based on the calls I get back, they know they are receiving a call specific to them from their mayor. This call comes from a phone number in the Office of Aging, so people can call back with questions and concerns. What was really important to me in this um, call was that it reaches a large group of people who've likely never reached out to the Cleveland Department of Aging because they may not have needed services. But with COVID-19, they may now. So each call provided them a phone number of a trusted resource, whether United Ways, 211, the Ohio Department of Health COVID hotline, or the Department of Aging. And if you're considering using a phone-based system, keeping good numbers is critical. We also have used the city's code red system to make calls specific uh, to specific lists to let them know we're here to help. So these messages would be from me directly. And um, in the last couple of weeks, I've made seven calls that have reached 5,877 individuals with either they answered live or it went to their voicemail. So it might be a list we pulled of people who'd gotten home repairs in the last couple of years or those who usually attend our produce distribution. 
Just in a, as an example, last week, Famicos Foundation, a long-standing trusted CDC and uh, Ward 7 reached out to me that they had some capacity to add seniors to their food delivery in three specific wards. They had food from their partnership with the Greater Cleveland Food Bank, but they needed more seniors um, who might be in need. They needed to know who were those seniors. So I was able to pull our list of people that we served with grass cutting, home repairs, daily phone calls, and we did a, another one of these robo calls out to them to let them know, um, one, that we were here, our phone number, we're here to help. And then I wanted to tell them specifically in these three wards about this food resource from Famicos. Within two hours, more than 70 seniors had signed up for the assistance. And in that delivery to their doorstep on Thursday and Friday, it was real faces, the faces of Famicos staff members and their councilmen. We do continue to operate our daily phone call program. This is called Cleveland Care Calls. This also uses the code red system, but this is a system we've had for 10 plus years. It makes an automated call to a recipient between the hours of 7 and 11 a.m. And um, if a person is okay, they press one. Um, if they don't answer, it calls back every five minutes for 25 minutes. And then at that point behind the scenes, we are making contact with their emergency contact. And if we can't make contact with them, we're connecting with public safety. We have seen an increase in the number of people on this system since COVID-19. It's a daily touch. I think like many of you, we also realized we needed to make very personal outgoing calls. Um, and so every week, the team at the Cleveland Department of Aging uh, makes wellness calls to individuals that we served last year with one or more programs. That list had more than 6,500 unduplicated clients on it. So we started with the oldest residents, and um, all staff are involved. We're currently right now this week calling those between the ages of 68 and 70 years old. It's really an opportunity to have a conversation for however long the senior wants. Sometimes it's about COVID, but I'll also share many times it's about the seeds they've just planted indoors, what movies they're watching, we're brainstorming ways with them to ask neighbors to get more books if they're out of reading materials. Um, staff can provide any resources they may need. We provide a phone number if they have any follow-up questions. And we ask them specifically, can we schedule a follow-up phone call with you? Uh, we uh, find like that's an important piece to get that on their calendar. Uh, we're also using this time to find out if they have a file of life at home and something they can hang on their refrigerator magnetic sleeve in case medical professionals um, need information. As of this week, we've made 3,850 calls. Now, I'll be honest, not every number is good. Some are disconnected, they're out of minutes, um, but we are making attempts um, at all of the individuals we served last year. What I would say too is staff are really enjoying making these phone calls and we hear over and over that it matters to the senior that someone cares. And I'll also share that we know the value of virtual senior centers, some of the things Emily shared about, um, and we know so many of our colleagues in our network are adapting to this need. So it's really been someone's almost full-time job to keep up with all the good things happening in our network and who's doing what, and then to keep our staff trained on them so when a senior calls, they know the latest thing happening with iConnect or the latest thing happening um, with the Rose Centers for Aging Well, their virtual bingo. Um, so in order to reach more people, we did launch a program for the month of April. It's not a permanent program, but it's called Stay Dialed in Cleveland. And every Tuesday and Thursday at 2 o'clock, we have a phone conversation with anyone who calls in for about 30 minutes. We usually provide about 15 to 20 minutes of information on a topic related to COVID, and then we open it up for questions and comments. Speakers have been the health director from the Cleveland Health Department, a silver sneakers instru instructor. I've been a speaker. I would just say an important feature of this call is that we wanted to make it a local number. So we purchased a line from a, a company called Uber Conference that gave us a 216 number. It also gave us the ability to control some features that we knew might be challenging, like the ding that happens when you join a conference call, which can sometimes be distracting, or the pin code to enter, or 
the area code that's outside of the area. And so the operator of this call can see who's on the call, has the ability to monitor, mute, unmute as needed. Um, in addition to sharing with older adults, we've also used this as a mechanism to connect to senior center apartment buildings. I'll share that um, we, for those who are online, we have really increased our um, resources we've been promoting on our Facebook and Twitter options, whether it's um, online groups, grocery delivery options, fun online experiences like what's happening with Michael Simon each night with, with a cooking demonstration or the zoo, um, the virtual tours, the art museum. So our staff compiled a computer resource guide to be able to um, help get people even more connected for those that have devices. I will just say, um, I've also learned so many unique resources in this time. My mother's 85. She's never been on a computer, did not want to be on a computer. Um, but I learned about from a resource um, with the National Council on Aging about a grand pad. And I purchased it for my mother, didn't ask for permission, just purchased it and sort of hoped it would turn out okay. And I can see all that she's on. It's designed for someone 75 and over who's never been on it. And I'll just say that when I looked at it just before this started, she has spent 11 hours and 8 minutes on video calls in just the 15 days she's had it, 6 hours and 14 minutes looking at pictures we uploaded, and only 29 minutes on the Internet. But it gives her an opportunity to see all of us. We've also included, encouraged all of our senior um, rec center leaders, volunteer leaders, to call each of their exercise participants. There's more. There's 22 rec centers in the city. Most of them have senior groups. They're led by peers, and to create phone trees. Lastly, I'll just share. We've been doing large-scale mailings of information, working with council members on creative ways to reach seniors in their ward, whether it's door hanging um, of flyers. We're thinking outside the box when anyone calls and has an idea, I, I want to start with yes and how can we make this happen. Um, we get a large number of volunteers who are reaching out to us wanting to know how to connect and knowing what each of the n people in the network is doing has been really helpful for us to be able to connect them to volunteers. Our team remains out in the community delivering emergency food boxes with the support of the Greater Cleveland Food Bank to homebound seniors, cutting grass, doing wellness checks, and I would just end with saying we linger a bit longer on the porch, making eye-to-eye -eye contact and smiling and connecting when we are there because we really know we might be the only person they see that week. So with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague Jill in the city of Solon. Thank you, Mary. Um, this is Jill Frankel, and um, I am from the city of Solon. Um, I want to thank both Mary and Emily for the great framework. Um, I'm going to touch on some of the issues that Mary mentioned as well. Um, and so let me tell you a little bit about the city of Solon and what our efforts to engage seniors. Um, uh, advanced slide. Danny, can you? There, there we go. Okay. Um, and then if we can advance again. So this slide shows us prior to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, we're a municipality of about 24,000 and about 30% of our residents are older adults. We offer robust recreational programs as well as supportive community living programs. If we can advance the slide again. Um, when, the, when the pandemic first began, we focused on safety, focused on the safety of our members, our residents, and our employees. We knew that we were going to need to take a hard dive into outreach and communication, nutrition support, and virtual programming. If we can advance again. Um, as far as nutrition is concerned, we were fortunate that we had a partnership already with the Cleveland Food Bank, and we were delivering commodity boxes as well as holding a monthly Solon mobile pantry distribution. When the pandemic hit, we did need to change those to drive-throughs and deliveries, but we modified our service method. Um, we also knew that we needed to develop new programs. 
We previously had a Meals on Wheels program, but due to lack of participation, we were able to refer out to meet our needs. But we knew when it, it set in that people could not leave their house, we were going to have seniors of low income and many who could not prepare all of their meals or leave their homes. We worked with a local school lunch provider and began delivering three to five meals once a week to about 50 people. Also, we were well aware that we had seniors that could not order groceries online. Some did not have access, some did not have tech skills, and some just didn't have the equipment. Some would not be able to get there because we were going to need to limit our transportation services and some couldn't leave their homes. So we, developed, we worked with two local groceries to develop grocery shopping and delivery programs. At first, it was, it was more simple than it became, but they were good programs. We also knew that we needed to be concerned about the mental health of the seniors. We have a social worker on staff who was already doing intake and referral. She is continuing to do her normal intake and referral, but is now dealing with multiple issues above and beyond that. We also had some support groups going, an Alzheimer's caregiver support group, as well as a Parkinson support group, and wanted to keep those going. We also thought about what about a support group for calm within the chaos to help people that are really having a difficult time dealing with the situation now. If we could advance the slide. Um, because of the stay-at-home orders, we knew that the lack of in-person contact was going to lead to isolation and loneliness. Prior to the pandemic, we had in the, in the works starting a virtual programming, but this kind of moved up our timeline. First, we, needed, we knew we needed to provide low-tech and high-tech. So for the low-tech purposes, we be, we've been delivering home packets. When we deliver out a commodity box or meals, we include an activity or maybe just a picture of us saying hello. We've delivered our art, art supplies to people that were already taking art classes, the choir we've delivered out CDs to, and we're going to be able to start virtual art classes and we'll be delivering supplies to those people as well. Um, for the video component, we, we looked at the video component as both an outreach, but as well as an inreach for when things open up. And that's why we were planning it prior to the pandemic. Um, we have developed both recorded and live videos. We really feel that local virtual programming is important because it provides that local connection and it allows people to feel like, hey, I can get to that. It's really important for the people that actually already came here because they get to see the instructors that they knew, the staff they knew from a familiar location. The recorded videos have an, a benefit of people can watch them whenever they want to, when they're feeling lonely and isolated. The live videos are important because they add a certain structure to the day. They know at 10 o'clock they need to be there like they were this morning, 20 people, for Zumba Gold. We started heavy with fitness because that's a large percentage of our participation. And we have moved on to discussion groups through Zoom Room and we're gonna be doing arts and speakers. Going back to the low tech connection, it is important and we knew it. So we wanted to have discussion groups. We were able to continue our Alzheimer's caregiver group as well as our Parkinson's support group on the phone. And this week we'll be starting Calm Within the Chaos. We also have developed a simple telephone tag game. Anyone that wants to, to make a call each day, we give them a number to call. We start in the morning with, a, with a, a nice message and it gets passed along. And at the end of the day, we get to hear what it is and we post that on Facebook. Prior to the pandemic, we knew the importance of volunteerism and providing opportunities for it. And we knew that we needed to do that now. People wanted something to do and they wanted to react. But we never ever want to turn some away, anyone away because we know and see the social capital it builds. So what could we do with volunteers? We knew that we didn't want to ask volunteers over the age of 60 to leave their homes. So we decided that we, they could help with outreach calls. We have seniors helping with the activity packets. We have the, our peer-led coordinators contacting their peers, and soon they may be sharing their skills virtually online. 
For those 60 and under, we had to recruit because we didn't have a lot of those volunteers, but we have recruited them. They are providing our grocery shopping services and our delivery services. If you can advance the slides. Okay. She'll get to me. She'll advance. So there we go. Communications. Um, Mary spoke a lot about telephone calls, and, and we also believe that telephone calls are extremely important. They allow us to, in, to connect. Thus far, we have called our complete database, and we used staff initially for all of those calls because they were meant to be well checks. They were meant to be instructional. They were meant to tell people how they could gain information in the future, and they also allowed us to update our database because we also had the same issues with Mary with the changing of over to cell phones and other things. We did hit many disconnected numbers. Um, we're also using the phone to make our daily sunshine calls, and now we're using the volunteers. Fortunately, we have the ability to robocall our regular participants, and we've used that ability probably once or every other week to the whole group as well as to smaller groups who we think might be interested in particular programs that we are developing. We've mailed letters. We've robo-emailed to both individuals and groups and we've increased our social media platform. We're posting daily on Facebook. We're using Facebook Live to do coffee and conversation with our Welcome Center staff because they're used to seeing those people in the morning. We've added subpages to our website, both a COVID response subpage as well as a virtual subpage, and we're using YouTube, YouTube Live, and Zoom. So if you can advance the slide. The next slide is going to be an infographic summary of our efforts on what we've been doing. It's pretty much what I just told you about. So I wanted to just discuss a few other things. And one is how has the pandemic shaped the perception of vulnerability of seniors in our community? So I would say if there could be good news from this, this might be one of the things. People are aware that seniors have needs. People now truly understand the effects of isolation, and they're reporting it to us. We have people thinking about seniors as well as those who are, vulner who are volunteering seeing the vulnerabilities. They're seeing that there are technology deficits, that a percentage of our seniors are low in income, that we have a very diverse population, and we have varying physical and mental, mental abilities. Our seniors, when we call them, and they're so thrilled to hear from us, we're getting the same type of comments as, as Mary is getting. Uh, I've lived in this community so long. This is so wonderful. The mayor is calling us. Um, they're just loving it. But what we're hearing from these seniors is that people are reaching out to them. And the volunteers are, are expressing the benefits of engagement. The maybe not so good news, I don't know if they're going to overgeneralize on these vulnerabilities when the pandemic is over. So what kind of issues have we faced in setting all of this up? Well, we've, there's been some for, in regards to safety, some communications, and some just for the individual. First and foremost, just like everyone else, we've had to adjust to constant changes to respond to the needs. Do we close? When do we close? When does the city close? How do we modify our services? How do we remodify our new services? How do we adjust to new, new, new services? And how do we adjust to volunteers' willingness to assist due to their changing information about the spread of the virus? The speed that we needed to develop new services was also an issue, obviously much quicker than we normally do. How do we fund them, especially in light of the lost revenue we're going to be having? Initially, we were able to divert some funding and operational lines as well as donations. We've reached out to our present funders regarding diverting fund, the funding that they're providing us, and we're hopeful that, we, that the live programming may be reimbursable. We're seeking new funders, and we're trying to figure out what will we do with our loss of revenue. Of course, there's been a few issues related to staff. How do they telework? We have been splitting shifts, and we're keeping. And how do we keep staff on safe while they're on site? The good news is we now have the whole senior center to use. 
So we have moved some workstations. We've utilized the full building down to everybody having their own personalized toilet and sink while they're at work. Um, due to the storms and power outages in the last couple weeks, we had to address our community-wide emergency planning. If people needed shelter, our plan was to bring them into the senior center and the community center, and that would not be enough space to physical distance. We've also experienced issues related to managing offers to assist and determining assistance needs. What we needed to figure out, what did we need, funding or volunteers? The city began getting all kinds of help for first responders, and so we as a city decided to ask people to donate to our 501c3. Um, we also needed to adjust our time. These requests take time to respond to, figure out what they want, and how can we best use them and make them get what they want out of the experience as well. So technology issues are concerned on a departmental and programming, in a programming end. We've had to figure out who can telework. We've had to, to figure out Zoom, YouTube Live, Facebook, all of that for our new virtual programming. We've seen changes in informal caregivers who could no longer get here to help their loved ones. The upside of the pandemic is that some people that live further away from their loved ones are now able to help because they're, needed, they're needing food ordered online or something along the li that lines of that. We also have needed to address census efforts. Would the pandemic get in the way of people responding, and we needed to make sure that we keep the focus on that as well because we know that that is vital for the future. Issues for the individual seniors, technology, I can't express it enough. Do they have access? Do they know how to use it? And what kind of ability do they have? We're concerned about people's mental health. We've been responding to fears of seniors, volunteers, and others. We've kept our support groups. And we've also needed to deal with the effects of isolation. Initially, in our first couple weeks of making our out calls, the staff was reporting that many of the seniors were saying they, they were okay. Now we're seeing an increase in the in-reach calls. We had been telling the seniors, please call us anytime we're here. They're telling us, I just need to talk to someone. Last week, we have an east side small network of directors from senior centers, and we represent 30 cities, and we met via Zoom. And one of the things that we discussed was that we were all noticing more reports of physical and mental declines, as well as deaths during this period, than we would have prior to the pandemic. So the question is, what could we use right now? We could use mobilization of additional resources especially those who might be able to provide technology and mental health assistance, maybe from organizations that weren't senior focused prior, prior to this. Now that we heard that the schools are closed for the year, will there be any availability to, for younger people to help from a distance? We also need funding relief. We need to know what our partners will be able to do and they need to know what we're doing and we need data and information. Truly, what are the best method, method, methods of programming? Low tech versus virtual. Do calls make a difference? In reach versus outreach. What are the true long-term more effects of, of isolation? And we need advocacy. In the long term, I would say one of the things that we need most for any community is technology, technology, technology. It meets basic needs. It helps people buy groceries. It helps them with telehealth. It allows them with their social integration. They can communicate with others. And it allows with communica community engagement and social integration because they can participate in virtual activities. We also need to some, we will need mental health assistance as well as more financial guidance at the senior center level. Our seniors were all retired and they're going to have seen any savings dwindle and possibly pensions gone. This might lead to job training needs. We're going to need advocacy for all of that, as well as funding. We're going to need businesses to modify their model and a possible um, shift in the importance of isolation on the vulnerability scale. 
locally in Solon, we need people to understand and recognize that we too have isolation. We have seen a good percentage of our seniors that are low income, and we have diversity. Close to 30% of our residents were born outside of the U.S. Um, also, I don't know once we once long term, but will they be overgeneralizing the vulnerabilities? And will it get rid of the work that we had done about the capabilities of seniors? So this comes, sums up what we're doing and where I think we need to go. Our team has worked with purpose. They are so wonderful. We too have not had a call off since this whole thing began. They just wanna work and they wanna be here. Even splitting shifts became a problem because they wanted to be here and they wanted to be working together to serve the seniors. So thank you very much for including me. And then the last slide is my contact information. Thank you, forgot to say advance the slide. <laughs> so I Okay. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, this is Danny Carlson, the Communications Director with Center for Community Solutions. Um, so normally we'll ask the presenters some questions that you have submitted through the attendee chat box and feel free to uh, submit some more of those questions in the last few minutes that we have here. I do wanna let everyone know that the slides will be available immediately after today's webinar and we will also post a recording of the webinar later this afternoon. Um, so feel free to type any additional questions in the attendee chat box. Um, but first, I'd like to ask our presenters today, thank you again for the presentations, um, kind of a question to the group, uh, is there any effort being made to reduce the digital divide among poor and disenfranchised seniors? Um, this is Mary from uh, the City of Cleveland Department of Aging. I think there's a lot of good work out there from groups like PCs for People and Ashbury Senior Centers and Digital C. I think one of the barriers is um, getting people to know those resources exist in the community. And then during this time, how do we provide the skills training that's needed to access? So whether we could get someone the hardware and the Wi-Fi connection may be one piece, uh, but then we know that it requires skills training. And um, from all that I've read and experienced myself, that's really sitting down next to someone in many cases who's not been, um, does not have a vast knowledge in this digital age. And this COVID-19 is really presenting a challenge with that. I would agree with, with Mary's thoughts. Um, we, we, to some extent, have been focusing, trying to put out the information for people that want to seek it out themselves, but our focus has been a little bit more on what we, could we do for them right now and providing tech for people that don't know it yet would, is, a, is a little bit bigger of an undertaking and requires a little bit more planning than, than just in the months that we've had so far. And this is Emily. I know that um, Spectrum has offered free internet services for students, at least in Cleveland during um, the pandemic. And I wonder if this is a, an opportunity for some advocacy to um, reach out to Spectrum and, and let them know that not only students need this, but also older adults would really benefit from the free or really discounted internet services. Great, and another question from the chat, uh, again, to the group. Um, this person's interested in hearing any feedback on additional ways that we can support the efforts of senior serving organizations right now. Um, from, this is Jill. Um, it, it, some of it in our community would depend on the age. Um, in others, I'm not sure, but my, my guess is that many could use assistance with the deliveries. They may need assistance with the outcalls, as well as advocating and assisting them with, with gathering funding for certain things. Um, 
it, you know, it, it's one of the things that's hard. It, could people make kits? I mean, it, it just depends on each and every person's skill set. So I, I don't really have a specific answer to that. I think it's more the advocacy for the overall picture and then reaching out to whoever you want. This is Mary from Cleveland. We've also just been really trying to push people who've called in to think about their own blocks that they live on. So in addition to what Jill says about the senior structure, we know there's many more seniors that aren't connected to uh, nonprofits providing these kinds of services. And so an opportunity that, you know, maybe is long overdue to introdu introduce yourself to the neighbor who lives a few doors down with your name and phone number. And anyone who calls in, we encourage them, leave them a note, tell them you live in the blue house, who you are, your phone number, and and give them some ways that you can personally help. Maybe it's picking up prescriptions. I think block by block, um, we can strengthen our communities, and that will have a long-lasting impact on quality of life for everyone in our community. Great. And then we had a, a follow-up question to the digital divide. Um, the, the question is that the challenge is getting the technology and the internet access to those who need it. Um, are there any suggestions from any of our presenters about how to kind of bridge that divide of getting that technology and that internet access to those who may not have it? I would just, um, I guess this is Mary, and I would share that we do have a technology resource guide that um, we can, um, we will we will make available. It's currently at the print shop. This is one of the strategies we were working on um, with several of the partners in the community. So we've compiled it, and it lists all of the different um, resources for skills, access, and um, Let's see, skills, access, access, and hardware. So those are the three domains you need to get successfully online. The, the computer itself, the skills to get on it, and then the Wi-Fi um, technical piece. So those three components can be really challenging to get during this time, but there is really good work out there. Every day I see, as an example, PCs for People is putting out there the number of laptops they have for those who are income eligible up on their site. They also recently did a TV20 age-friendly Cleveland show more about their organization. They're pretty new in town, but there's folks, as I mentioned, like Ashbury Senior Center in Cleveland, and I'm sure throughout our network, that have um, different kinds of computer resources. We'll get ours posted to our website, the City of Cleveland's um, website, and can share with the Center for Community Solutions to share with folks as well. Great, and we want to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, Will, I'm not sure if you had some closing remarks for today's webinar. Yes, thank you very much, Danny. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Will Tarter, Associate of Public Policy and External Affairs for the Center for Community Solutions. Thank you for attending today's webinar on social isolation and older adults. The Council on Older Persons and the Center for Community Solutions appreciates your attendance and your support. I want to personally apologize for the technical difficulty earlier, and we appreciate your patience and your understanding. As Danny mentioned, this webinar was recorded and will be available for your future reference. Additionally, we'll, we will send a follow-up note to all attendees with contact information for the presenters and additional resources for how public agencies are engaging with seniors during the pandemic. Thank you to our presenters, to our attendees, and to all those who helped to assemble this webinar, especially the Center for Community Solutions Director of Communications and Digital Strategy, Danny Carlson. Thank you everyone again, be safe, have a great afternoon, we are adjourned.